So the 78th Academy Awards were weird. Of course, as we all know, Crash won for Best Picture, snubbing Brokeback Mountain, Capote, Good Night and Good Luck, and Munich, and proving that, as Lindsay Ellis said in her Bright video, meditations on race that place the fault on flawed individuals rather than structural injustices or oppressive systems win awards. But something else happened that night. Not something new, but something as old as the Academy itself. And that was a movie set in Asia, but written, produced, and directed by white people, won quite a few awards that night. None of which, of course, were won by Asian people. And the Oscar goes to... Colleen Atwood, Memoirs of a Geisha. Memoirs of a Geisha, directed by Rob Marshall and adapted from the novel of the same name by white author Arthur Golden, was nominated for six awards that night, tying it with the likes of Brokeback Mountain. Not a small feat. It was nominated for Best Art Direction, Cinematography, Costume Design, Score, Sound Editing, and Sound Mixing. It won 30. And, like I said, films set in Asia with Asian characters, but that have a behind-the-scenes crew of white people looking for Oscar gold, has always been a staple at the Academy. Think of the 1937 adaptation of The Good Earth, where Chinese-American actress Anna Mae Wong was snubbed for the leading role due to miscegenation being illegal, and thus the white actress that was cast in her place one for Best Actress instead. And I'll say it louder for the people in the back, systemic racism has always given white people more opportunities and advantages over people of color, period. So some 60 odd years later, and by the time Memoirs of a Geisha was in production, Asian movies seemed to be a safe bet, even ones backed by Asian people themselves were doing well. Ang Lee's Crouching Tiger Hidden Dragon came out in 2000, Wayne Wong's The Joy Luck Club came out in 1997, um, oh wait, nobody cared about that. Um, Jackie Chan seemed to be kind of on top of the world. And of course, the granddaddy of Asian Oscar bait, Bernardo Bertolucci's The Last Emperor, came out in 1987 and won basically every award that year. So before we go any further, let me introduce myself. My name is Cheyenne and I'm an Asian American adoptee and expat living in Brazil. I post new videos every Tuesday about pop culture, so if you want to see them, please subscribe and ring the bell to be notified every time I post a new video. And if you do end up liking this video, please give it a like and leave a comment to help me with the algorithm. And if you want to help the channel grow, check out my Patreon page, the link is in the description. So this video is going to be about Asian Oscar bait, or movies set in Asia with an Asian cast, but that is predominantly backed by white people looking to win Oscars. And how that, of course, hurts Asian creatives. I'm going to be using several examples, mainly The Last Emperor, Memoirs of a Geisha, and Slumdog Millionaire, but, you know, I don't have time to list them all. So if you know more, please list them down in the comments below. This also isn't necessarily an Asian phenomenon, as Green Book won in 2018, and it was a movie about, or supposed to be about, Don Shirley, um, but it was mainly backed by white people, and actually Don Shirley's family wasn't even consulted for the movie. And lastly, I do think white people can write and direct people of color well, it's just that it's very telling how racist Hollywood is when white people are the ones constantly being rewarded, getting the nominations and clout, while the people of color behind the scenes and in front of the camera are almost never rewarded the same way. We don't always need white people, you know? It just takes time, resources, and money away from people of color who are already working with an unequal playing field. So without further ado, let's get back to the show. So let's start off with one of the most well-known Asian Oscar bait movies, The Last Emperor, as it was probably the biggest white-backed Asian Oscar bait film that people knew about when Memoirs was in theaters, and it perfectly exemplifies how white filmmakers love to exploit the East for Oscar gold without actually caring if the actors themselves, sometimes the only Asian people on set, get their due or not. The Last Emperor is an epic film that spans the life of the Last Emperor, Hu Yi, from when he's a child up until he's an elderly adult. The film hosts an all-Chinese cast, except for the white tutor. And though it was nominated for nine Oscars and won all of them, including Best Picture, not one of those nominations went to Chinese cast members. They all went to the white people working behind the scenes. The movie was also strategically made in English. And of course, with the white tutor, Pu Yi needs to speak English. But even before and after the tutor enters his life, when he's just talking with the court or to his wives, he still speaks English. I am accused of being a traitor, a collaborator, and a counter-revolutionary. Why, you may ask? So it wouldn't be seen as a foreign film. 
If you've been part of the Oscar discourse, trademark, for a while, you may know that a lot of Asian American films are being made. The Farewell, Minari are prominent ones that got a lot of award buzz, but they were nominated in the Best Foreign Language Film category, even though they're made by American directors and writers who also just happen to be Asian. Now, if you're a white filmmaker looking for Oscar gold, you can't have the Academy, who are mostly white people as the Academy is made up of people who already have Oscars, think that your film is inaccessible, foreign, and therefore weird. So you make the actress speak English for the majority of the film, even though it makes little sense, and you do not, for God's sake, set it in the US and have Asian people in America. Uh, see the Joy Luck Club as to why. Instead, you set it in the nebulous East. Here you get all the exotic flavor primed for Oscar nominations. The sets, location, music, costumes, but with none of that race stuff or actually caring if the actors get nominations or not. Side note, they usually never do. So this was the landscape Bob Marshall, who just came off an Oscar nom for Best Director with Chicago in 2002, and Steven Spielberg, one of the producers and who was going to direct at one point after the rights of the movie were bought in 1997, the same year as the book was published, were getting into. They saw that movies set in Asia with Asian people speaking English makes money, that Asian things in general were doing kind of well in the early 2000s, and that Asian Oscar bait movies usually win people behind the scenes awards, and thus Memoirs of a Geisha was born. And side note, before we go on and people come at me in the comments, I don't think Asian Oscar bait is necessarily intentional, and I do appreciate films like The Last Emperor, despite the director's uh, checkered past, um, but it is a very obvious pattern whose impact is still hurtful to Asian creatives as white people are given awards and praise for telling Asian stories, but Asian people themselves aren't given the same kind of clout when telling their own stories. <music> Memoirs of the Geisha centers around the life of a young girl named Chio and how her and her sister were sold as children as their father could no longer take care of them. Chio's sister was sold to a brothel because she was older, but Chio, who is the younger sister, is sold to an okia or geisha house because of her exotic blue eyes, which represent the water in her spirit. In the okia, the mother of the house takes care of Chio and pays for her geisha lessons until she's able to start earning money and pay back her debts. Chio, of course, hates working at the geisha house as she's a child living with strangers who is also forced to do a lot of manual labor and tries to run away. But after meeting Ken Watanabe's character of the chairman, who shows her kindness, she decides to become a geisha in order to be part of his world. She takes on the new name of Sayuri and ends up becoming the most successful geisha in all of Kyoto and perhaps Japan, but sadly it seems as though the chairman doesn't return her feelings for him. Then World War II breaks out and she hides out in a factory, dyeing silk, and survives the war. She then goes back to the geisha house and continues her activities, but she makes less and less money as Japan has been ravaged by war. She wishes to leave the geisha life forever, as it's not as glamorous as it once was, but also because the chairman doesn't seem to love her. But her mentor tells her that she has no choice, and that when you're a geisha, you give up your own free will and happiness. Sayori disagrees with this and tries to hatch a plan to get the chairman to notice her, but it backfires, and that's seemingly the end of that. However, a few years later, the chairman and Sayori reunite and finally confess their true feelings for one another, and all is well that ends well, the end. For a movie with a pretty basic plot, it got a lot of pushback even in 2005 when it was released, mainly because of the casting of Chinese leads rather than Japanese leads, and thus show that the production team behind the movie didn't care too much about what culture they were adapting as long as the actors had slanty eyes and could bring in money. And though Gong Li, Michelle Yeoh, and Zhang Ziyi are amazing actors, they're not Japanese and that wasn't right. Another part of the outrage was because it was adapted from Golden's book of the same name, where Mineko Iwasaki, his gateway into the geisha world, later sued him for defamation and for soiling the reputation of the geisha profession. They would later settle out of court and she would write her own biopic entitled Geisha of Gion, where she, like Sayori, writes about feeling trapped in the flower and willow world. And though this backlash was about the book and not the movie, a lot of people questioned the authenticity of both, as both were made by white people, and also since actual geisha like Mineko Iwasaki didn't seem to be too pleased with the book, who's to say with the movie? The main point of contention, of course, was the sex aspect. Do geisha have sex with their clients or don't they? And of course, there's a lot of this kind of rhetoric that geisha are artists and not sex workers, 
and though they have to be flirtatious on the job, doesn't mean that anything ever happens. And it honestly is just really annoying that people need to know the truth. Like, who cares if they have sex with their clients or not as long as it's consensual? Sayo Masuda, who was a geisha during the mid-50s, wrote a memoir entitled Autobiography of a Geisha, where she wrote about some really bad experiences she had while working as a geisha and how she was even suicidal at some points. And then after it was published, she had to move towns because her community was so offended. And it's not easy to speak out about this kind of stuff, but it's important. A tradition can be beloved and part of, you know, a culture, but it can also have a hard pass to swallow, and that's fine as long as we acknowledge it and try to do better. Something that I think is cool that isn't explored too much is that men were actually the original geisha, and there are still some men practicing today. It wasn't always a binary venture, which is awesome. But of course, as the tradition seems to be dying out, the blame is placed on a lot of women who have the burden of carrying this thing on when in reality it's capitalism's fault that people don't want to be geisha. Of course, those who love it will pursue it regardless and help uphold the tradition, and I'm sure it will never die out completely. And perhaps this backlash of geisha artisans and not sex workers is because of the stigma associated with sex work in general, but I also don't think that geisha do have sex with their clients, but if they do, we obviously shouldn't shame them for it or try to exotify it in any way. I think that if they do have sex with their clients, that both can be true. You can be an incredibly skilled artist and also be a sex worker. Like, it doesn't need to be this harsh binary. But in the end, when you come down to it, being a geisha is a customer service job. You have to be jovial and skilled and entertained, and it's not easy putting on that happy face, especially with people who have monetary power over you. It's not surprising that it's not a very popular profession anymore because it's a really hard job and not one many people can take on with ease. So this might come as a surprise to you as I've kind of shat on this movie for the past few minutes due to the fact that geisha culture was just used by white people to sell books and later to get Oscars, the fact that they didn't authentically illustrate the life of geisha or cast Japanese actors, etc. And knowing all this, I can still watch and enjoy the movie. Well, not the assault scene, that was honestly unnecessary and horrible to watch, but that's what wins Oscars, right? But the movie is just visually stunning. The costumes, the makeup, the sets, and of course the cinematography. The scene where Sayuri is dyeing silk and it looks like blood always gets me. Grappling with the fact that you like something problematic is hard, but most things in life have problems, and as long as you acknowledge them, don't defend them, and educate yourself, I don't think there's too much harm in it. And I also think that me saying I like it doesn't also mean that I endorse its flaws. I think that gets lost in the shuffle of internet criticism. You either need to love or hate something when both feelings can exist at the same time. Another reason why I like the movie is completely personal. If you know me, I like historical fiction and historical dramas, but most of them are white. Memoirs of a Geisha was one of the first historical fiction books I ever read and one of the first historical dramas I ever watched, and it was a game changer. Seeing Asian women on a big scale just being beautiful, glamorous, having interpersonal lives, personalities, dreams, and goals was just mind-boggling to me, especially as someone who grew up in a majority white media landscape. And they spoke English just like me. Growing up, there were very few, like, if any shows about Asian people just living their lives and speaking English. So that was really honestly awesome to see. Memoirs also made me seek out more movies like it, and I started to get into actual Japanese films like Helter Skelter and Norwegian Wood. Definitely recommend those, by the way. And later, I expanded my list to include films from South Korea like The Handmaiden and Chinese films like Farewell, My Concubine. When it comes down to it, Memoirs of a Geisha is a movie about women the geisha mother, the auntie, the jealous prima donna, the mentor, and the heroine. It's about them and their lives and just trying to make the best out of what they've been given, and it's just nice to see. However, a few things do annoy me. Firstly, the blue eyes thing. I think that's kind of ridiculous, speechless, and honestly a little colorist that they need to give this character, like, white features. I'm sure, of course, that it wasn't intentional, but it's still weird. <laughs> Secondly, of course, the casting choices. Thirdly, one of the characters in the book, who is a very prominent character, is disfigured in the book. 
his face has been burned and he also doesn't have an arm. But in the movie, like, they kind of get rid of his scarring and he also has an arm or he has both arms. And it was weird, too. Like, that was another weird thing. And lastly, of course, that the characters are made to speak English. Of course, so it's not seen as a foreign film. And actually, fun fact, or I guess strange fact, is that the sound mixers were nominated for Oscars for making the actors' phonetics better because they're not native speakers. And they were actually nominated for Oscars for making the actors have better English, but the actors weren't awarded for trying their best to speak a language that they're not fluent in. Anyway, let's go back to the 2006 Oscars. And the Oscar goes to Ang Lee for Brokeback Mountain. This is the first Academy Award for Ang Lee and his third nomination. As director for Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, he accepted the foreign language film Oscar for Taiwan. Wow. I wish I know how to quit you. <laughs> Though the award ceremony seemed like a bust that year, there was one good thing to come out of that night, and that was that Ang Lee became the first non-white director to win Best Director. And that was freaking huge! Ang Lee, a Taiwanese-American director, won for Brokeback Mountain, and it was so well-deserved. He was put on the map a few years before, of course, with Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, which kind of renewed an interest in the East. Asian films set in Asia by Asian filmmakers have been noticed by the Academy since the 50s, and have usually been placed in the Best Foreign Language Film category. It wasn't until the 80s with Ismail Merchant's film Room with a View in 1986 that an Asian filmmaker was nominated for and Bong Joon-ho's Parasite is the only Asian picture to win this category ever. But of course, the Oscars aren't the best metric to measure films in general, since like Bong Joon-ho said, they're not an international award ceremony. They're an American one. And also, they're just like a broken mess. As we've seen with Crash, it doesn't really matter how good a film is. What matters is your For Your Consideration campaign and how many voters you can sway to your side. For example, Farewell My Concubine, which is a cinematic masterpiece, won the Palme d'Or, but was completely snubbed at the Oscars and wasn't even nominated for Best Picture. In fact, Parasite and Marty, a movie which came out in 1955, are the only Palme d'Or winners ever to also win Best Picture at the Academy Awards. And though it seems as though the Oscars don't really matter because there are bigger awards to win, they actually kind of do matter. The Oscar effect, or the Oscar bump, otherwise known as having a nomination, adds millions of dollars to box office revenue. Most notably, American Sniper that came out in 2014 earned 90% of its revenue, both domestic and international, after it was nominated for Best Picture. 90%. Not to mention you get the prestige of being nominated, and also if you win, you become a voting member of the Academy and can help boost other projects. And it's notable to point out that the problems with the Oscars stem even further than Best Picture nominations and wins, but to acting snubs as well. So just two years later, another white-backed Oscar bait movie was made, and that was, of course, the giant that was Slumdog Millionaire. Though based on a book by Indian author and diplomat Vikas Swarup, the film adaptation was backed by white British men that starred an Indian cast. The premise of the film is about Jamal, Dev Patel's character, answering questions on who wants to be a millionaire by remembering his childhood and young adulthood. The film itself received reviews ranging from mixed to very critical and negative from Indian people who live in India and the greater diaspora. As the movie itself kind of aestheticizes poverty and Jamal uses British English. And if you were alive during 2008, you know how big this movie was. It broke box office record after box office record, especially in the UK. It did extremely well and put Dev Patel on the map as he would later work with Ang Lee in Life of Pi in 2012. And of course, this film was pure Oscar gold. It had the exotic Indian flair, the music, the costumes, the setting, and of course, it was made accessible to the white majority. It was the 8th film ever to win 8 Academy Awards and the 11th Best Picture winner without a single acting nomination, 
and was the last film to do so until Parasite in 2019. Coincidence? I think not. The Oscars that Slumdog Millionaire did win were all for behind-the-scenes stuff, and of course the white dude got his director award, and most prestigiously, of course, like I said, it won for Best Picture. Once again, much like Memoirs of a Geisha, an Asian-centered film set in Asia with an all-Asian cast was used to win white people trophies. The only good thing to come out of this was, of course, that a few Indian filmmakers behind the scenes also won individual Oscars for their talents, including A.R. Rahman for Best Original Score and Best Original Song. There's a uh, dialogue from the Hindi film called Mere Paas Maa Hai, which means I have nothing, but I have a mother. So mother's here, and <laughs> um, her blessings are there with me. I'm grateful for her to have come all the way. And Rasul Bukhari for Best Sound Mixing. So I dedicate this award to my country. Thank you, Academy. This is not just a sound award. This is history being handed over to me. But let's focus on the fact that this movie won Best Picture, just like The Last Emperor, but got zero acting nominations, just like The Last Emperor. And later, of course, this would happen again with Parasite. And that's not to say that the behind-the-scenes people, especially the people of color working behind the scenes, don't deserve their awards because they do. But just how can you win Best Picture and not also have great actors and performances and not even get a single nomination? Just for reference, Merle Overton, an actress of Indian and Maori descent, remains the only Asian actress with a Best Actress nomination, and that was in 1937. And things are even bleaker for Asian American actresses, as only two have ever been nominated for Best Supporting Actress. Miyoshi Umeki, a Japanese American actress and the only Asian American actress to have an Oscar, won in 1957 while Shorei Agdashu was nominated in 2003, almost 50 years later, and lost. Whether you're an Asian actor from Asia or an Asian American actor from the US, your chances of winning any award at the Academy seems bleak, but especially if you're trying to be noticed as an actor. And the answer to why the racial gatekeeping around the four prestigious acting awards are kept so tight is because the Academy simply favors white actors and wants to keep their privilege and their fame and fortune and not share it with other people of other backgrounds, it's that simple. It should come as no surprise that the four acting awards at the Oscars went to white people even though the best picture was about Korean people. And it's even less surprising when you see the statistics and likelihood of a movie in a foreign language other than French or Italian being nominated for an acting Oscar. And even French acting performances were only recognized twice. Who's to say a language that's not from Western Europe like Korean or Hindi or Chinese? And this language bias not only hurts movies made by white people about Asia or movies made by Asian people about Asia, but Asian people from the U.S. making films about themselves. You'd think as a very American and insular institution, the Oscars would be more receptive of Asian American movies. But the exact opposite is true. Pictures set in the U.S. about Asian American issues continue to be put in the best foreign language film category because Asian. It seems as though it's okay to be Asian when you're being used to get a white person's trophy, but when you're telling your own story about your own life and experiences as an immigrant, the Academy just doesn't know what to do with you. So the Oscars are still a very white institution, a very white American institution, and even with these new rules they have in place to create more diverse films like they're not really gonna do anything movies about minorities and movies that are being made by minorities about themselves are already out there they already exist you just need to find them and promote them it's that easy i guess the good thing is that not a lot of people care about the oscars anymore but they are still trying to stay in our lives and stay relevant but my advice is just to not give too much credence to them at all and just look for movies on your own whether the Oscars give a crap about them or not. Please help me with the algorithm, like and comment on this video because engagement is the best metric to show the algorithm that you liked this video. And yeah, thank you so much for watching. This video was, you know, a lot of fun to make and something that I really truly care about. So again, thank you so much for watching. Shout out to the patrons and my subscribers. Thank you so much. Have a good one.